It's been 20 years since Cornerstone Elementary opened its doors with the concept of parents joining the teachers in the classroom. I had a chance to catch up with some teachers, parents, and students who attended the 20th anniversary celebration, and they're all very proud to be a part of the Cornerstone family. We believe in parent participation, parents in the classroom, not just to cut and paste or file, but are actually supportive members, uh, assistants, if you will, in the classroom so that the teacher can truly teach. She can, or he can, share a concept with a small group while other parents are working with other small groups, art, science, math, whatever. So parents in the classroom is what we believe in. From a teaching perspective, it must be kind of exciting for kids to have their parents in school with them sometimes. Oh, they love having their parents in school and they love having their dads here on occasion. We always have some dads that spend a lot of time and then we have some dads that are only able to spend a little bit of time and the kids get really excited when their parents are here. What's the parents' favorite things to do when they're in the classroom? Um, I think they like working directly with the children with mm -hmm. a project, either an art project or say doing a math game or a sight word bingo or some kind of a skill. I think they enjoy really feeling like they're making a difference with the kids and um, enhancing the curriculum. It also seems like it must be very rewarding for the parents to be able to spend more time with their kids, especially when you're working or you're busy all the time. Well, they get to know the whole picture of what education is all about. Plus, they can be more supportive of, of what their children are doing in school and help them to be successful. No, this, this school is amazing. And, and again, you could probably go to universities and go to experts on public education and what it takes to build a successful school, but this is school is a model of that. Um, you know, you have, the parents are just very involved. You have an outstanding teaching staff. You have an outstanding principal who carries the vision of the school. So it's, it, it really, it's really a family atmosphere. It's like a team working together to make this happen. This doesn't happen by accident. This success is because the team is here doing it. You know, when, when you sign up to come to Cornerstone, every family signs a contract that you are required to put in a certain amount of hours and it's a, you know depending on how many children you have those are the shifts that you're assigned you got to just work it into your schedule and we're blessed to be able to invest in this time with our kids and it's it's worth the scramble in the morning to you know get ready for work and get your kids and then to leave work to come to do your shifts at school but it's a special special opportunity for the parents What's it like for you as a parent to come into a classroom and work with your kids? It's very humbling uh, at first because you very quickly see how hard it is to be a teacher. Yeah. And while our classes are relatively small, uh, it's just 24 kids. Mm -hmm. uh, in second grade, where I'm a teaching parent, they're like herding cats, and they're going in all they're going in all directions. Uh, but the way that the, the teacher carries that energy and directs it, and 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 the smiles and and the fun that the kids are having while they're learning is is very humbling uh, for me. I mean, I I think I'm lucky to have the opportunity to be able to spend just that little bit of time uh, in the classroom helping out wherever I can help out uh, as one of the teaching parents. Most of the parents that I've met here come from well-educated backgrounds, nice families. They understand the importance of a good education. What's it like to have your mom or your dad in the classroom while you're at school during the day? Well, it's fun because like, if I need help, they always come over and help me and stuff. As a student, what is that like to have your parents in the classroom? I think it's actually pretty fun. It is fun. To have them come into your classroom and help out with the teacher. And what kind of things do they do when you're in the classroom? They help out with the teacher. Um, sometimes when you need help on work or you need it corrected, um, then they'll do it for you. Tell me what it's like to have your mom in the classroom with you. Well, I think it's great because she can know what I do in class and she can just know what we're doing. I just want to congratulate Cornerstone on 20 great years. It's uh, I can I can meet with superintendents all over Los Angeles County, and I can see comparisons. This is like one of the finest schools anywhere. 
For over 50 years, a group of local writers have been getting together each week at the Palace Verdes Library. I had a chance to visit with the group and meet many authors who have had books published and two who became publishers right here in our community. I haven't been here since the 50s, but um, the writing group has, and we have one member who's been here about 30 years. Um, I've been coming 15 years, which makes the lie about my age a little awkward, but <laughs> and um, it's a great group. It meets uh, once a week on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's been here all along. Its name is the uh, Millie Ames Writing Group. She's the founder, and um, that she's the one who got it going, and it's been popular over the years. So we've had times when there's been two or three people, and there's times when it's standing room only and people have to leave. So it just really does fluctuate over the years. I was going to ask you about that. How, how do people get involved? What's the criteria for entering the group? Um, all that. Well, in general, um, we don't accept things like poetry and screenplays because that's just a little bit hard to judge, right. you know, as a as an author and as a writer. So uh, we prefer novels or, um, you know, maybe nonfiction. Uh, we had one woman come and write a bestseller here, uh, Wesley the Owl. Her name was Stacy O'Brien, and she wrote the most poignant story about her life with an owl. So and and then it hit the number twelve on the bestseller list. So that was really exciting for all of us to watch. You know, somebody make it. Not only are you a writing group, but you are published as well. Many of your authors are published. Um, talk about that process because I think that a lot of people, probably everybody at one time or another has said, I want to write a book. But then where do you go from there? So talk about the process. It's a very tricky process. Um, I have a master's degree in writing and so it's like that's where I thought I was going to go. But the the writing community doesn't always cooperate with your goals so sometimes you have to think outside the box I got very lucky I met um, my business partner Geneve uh, we met in this group and we sat down one night and we discussed what we wanted in a publishing house and after we were done we actually had a list and I said I think we have a publishing house and she said yeah I think we do and so we actually started um, World Nouveau which is has an imprint called Mischievous Muse Press and we uh, publish books, and so we were able to hand select some of the authors um, in this group. They submitted to us, we accept their books, and so these are some of the books that we published, and um, it's going really well. It's really fun to watch them launch their books. We go to the Book Frog locally here in, in the mall and do book launches with them, and um, you know, it's fun to fulfill the dreams of these authors. Um, but you are also the art director, and when we think of books, I think that the cover of the book is always so important. How does somebody know what to select for artwork? Well, you have to really tune into the book and see what's appropriate for the story itself. Um, so definitely an art director has to read the books. Okay. <laughs> but also, it's not just about the book, because what the cover needs to do is entice a person mm -hmm. it's not just s tell it like it is it's it's more uh, a psychological effect mm -hmm. and so you really have to tune into what would speak to a person not just what would tell a person that what the book was about what was it like for you the first time you saw your book ready to go and ready to sell you mean as an actual book yes. like this like holding it yes. as an actual book <laughs> yes <laughs> It was awesome, yeah. Just having having the the book be real, because um, I'm one of those people that took a lot longer <laughs> to write it. it. Took me seven years, but the, but it was a trilogy, so it took me seven years to write all three books, uh, 900 pages. But um, but it was for the first one, just seeing the first one all done and real, and uh, especially seeing it on a bookshelf in a bookstore, that was really where it hit me was just like, wow, this is something real that I put out into the world. So and you can see more about authors in our community on upcoming episodes of Around the Peninsula, so check your local listings. There has been a growing concern over the coyote population on the peninsula. As a result, many residents have questions regarding what they can do to be safe. Liz Brown Swanson discussed the situation with a wildlife specialist and a city official to get some answers. 
Well, recently we've gotten a lot of calls about coyote sightings in the, in the community, and, and we did have one incident that I'm aware of where we had a coyote attack on a small animal. So naturally the city be concerned with public safety and wanting to be able to educate the community about what coyotes are and how to live with them. So we're kind of moving towards an educational campaign to the community to, to help them understand exactly how do you live with coyotes and coexist with them. I guess the key is to learn how what to do and what not to do. So let's just start off with... Um, what do you do when you know there are coyotes that are, you know, in your yard? What do you do? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing is if you have a coyote in your neighborhood is first not to worry. The vast majority of coyotes are very afraid of people and they will actually go out of their way to avoid us. Um, but if you do have a coyote in your yard or neighborhood that isn't running away from you when they see you, the most important thing to do is to look big and loud. So we call this hazing a coyote. So there's lots of fun things you can do. You can uh, buy an air horn, one of these little air horns you can find at any party store. Uh, you can blow it and it makes a loud noise. That'll scare any coyote away. Maybe oh, uh, neighbors and kids and, and pets in the neighborhood. <laughs> You can carry a whistle with you when you're walking your dog, and if you see a coyote, you just blow the whistle. Uh, you can even make homemade hazing tools. So this is just a sippy cup with some pennies in it, or you could put dead batteries in it, just shake it at the coyote. And what happens is they will learn through those noises that people are scary, and they'll avoid us. Um, the other important thing is if you see a coyote in your yard or your neighborhood, you always want to stop and think, why are they here? And the answer almost always is food. So if you have pet food outside, um, fruit trees are a big attractant for coyotes. They actually, a lot of their diet is made up of fruit. So if you have fruit trees and the fruit's falling on the ground, it's really important to pick it up. Uh, if your trash is overflowing or not secured, you want to secure that. So, you know, making sure that you don't have any food attractants is really important. And talk to your neighbors. You know, let them know in a nice way. You know, these fruit trees you have here are attracting coyotes into the area. And then finally, if you have pets, it's very important never to let your pets outside unattended. <laughs>